good evening all uh, greetings from isa national headquarters i am dr navin malhotra your own secretary isa national and welcome to isa online pg classes today we have amongst us very respected very dear professor kajal jain from pgi chandigarh and she will be deliberating on a very very practical topic anesthesia for cesarean section updates on safe practice I welcome you, uh, Professor Kajal Jain, Madam, and uh, I shall be handing over to now coordinator, Dr. Parul Jindal, to carry forward the proceedings. Dr. Parul Jindal, please. Thank you so much, sir. I am just sharing my screen, sir. A very good evening to all of you. As sir has very rightly said, these weekly PG online classes, an initiative by Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, has garnered more than one lakh views since they began one year ago. And we are live streaming at YouTube today at the rate of ISA NHQ. The class, uh, we have to keep a few things in mind. Kindly keep your mobiles or your laptops on mute while the lecture is going on. Ma'am will be posting a few questions on the screen at the middle of the sessions and you have to answer the questions and the poll will be told to ma'am which will be discussed further and if you have any questions you can uh, type them in the chat box and this will be taken at the end of the session by ma'am so dr kajal ma'am is a professor at department of anesthesia and intensive care at pgi chandigarh she's a course coordinator for dm in trauma and acute care she's a secretary of association of obstetric anesthesiologists in of india and her research interest is in trauma and obstetric anesthesia and cadaveric organ transplant. She's an invited speaker at numerous meetings and faculty for workshops and has more than 100 publications in various national and international journals. She has numerous awards in obstetric anesthesia and has a few chapters in books. So over to you, ma'am. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much. Uh, am I allowed to share my screen? Uh, Yes, you can please. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So first and foremost, I'm uh, very grateful to our National Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, um, the, the esteemed panel of leaders. They have uh, come out with a very uh, brilliant idea of delivering uh, PG courses to all our students, uh, which I feel is a, is a very noble uh, gesture on their part, because uh, we all need to update ourselves from time to time. And what would be you know, better than listening to seniors and um, from our own experience and delivering it to our own students uh, in, throughout India. So I'm really humbled by their noble gesture. And I feel extremely proud to be talking on a very important topic today, uh, that is anesthesia for cesarean section, safe practices. I say that because uh, we all know that um, cesarean sections are considered to be a very simple kind of procedure by many of us. And uh, despite being so simple and so safe, there are so many issues which arise from day to day. And we uh, kind of we have to face litigations or we have to face adverse events and critical events so many times. So that probably happens because uh, we have seen that uh, pregnant women are sort of a unique population. And that happens because there are so many physiological changes which take place during the course of nine months and uh, to accommodate the growing fetus. The mother has an increased cardiac output and then there's a growing fetus which occupies the abdomen and pushes the diaphragm up, leading to some difficulties in breathing and so on and so forth. So these all changes put together, put, put these patients into a set of uh, population which we call a unique population. Along with that, we have also got to take care of the baby when the cesarean section is contemplated especially if it's a category one cesarean section. I'll be telling you what is category one cesarean section. Then so many times we are not even able to hold pre-operative formal interview because there is an urgency for the cesarean sections and we have to wheel them up, uh, wheel them in uh, as soon as possible. Informed consent is also difficult because women may be uh, in severe pain, distress, or there's an emergency section which is going to take place. This happens when a patient is laboring 
and now has we get a call for a emergency c section sometimes when patients come in the middle of the night due to fatigue lack of sleep there are high risks of error in these women also if we do not have good communication skills we may, may not be able to you know communicate the kind of uh, uh, difficulties we are going to face and that can also lead to adverse events so we also sometimes some of us lack knowledge uh, of medical legal litigations in this subset of population so all these things also place us at a slightly higher risk and therefore we need to understand what are the safe practices of cesarean section so if i ask the students like what is the classification of a pregnant patient who is 39 weeks with severe preeclampsia would you classify her as asa2 2e 3 3e or asa4 so dr parul um, we'll wait for the yes audience. ma'am we'll wait for the answers mm -hmm. uh, ma'am they're saying your voice is too low could you just speak up uh, don't know if you go the volume our audio is fine parul our audio is fine okay ma'am Okay. Uh, uh, so I request everyone to post me, their answers to, to the question which has been posed by ma'am. The question is: What is the classification of a pregnant, thirty-nine week patient with a severe preeclampsia? Is it ASA grade two, ASA grade two E, ASA grade three, ASA three E, or ASA grade four? So, ma'am, we've started Can having some answers. Can I have a minute or so to answer? Yes, sir. Ma'am, we have an answer like three A. Someone is saying it's a three E. Again, A is a great three. Wait for one minute, Parul. Wait for one minute. Yes, sir. So I'm just giving the answers. What I've come. Otherwise, other will be prompted. Uh, wait for one minute, please. Ji. Even I can see, so there is no need to worry. I can also see. So, ma'am, till now we have some. All of them saying either three. Some have said two. The others have said four. Grade three. So, uh, so what I I'm impressed that uh, people at least they are uh, most of them are categorizing these women as uh, ASA three E because this patient is like thirty nine week with severe preeclampsia and uh, I haven't said that she comes of with C section so I take three and three E both as uh, the classification so I'm happy that people have uh, you know categorized them as. Um, high risk for um, uh, an operative delivery and that is because um, as for a normal pregnant patient also asa american society of anesthesiologists have classified pregnancy per se as asa2 because of the the systematic changes which take place in the body of a woman that it has been categorized as asa2 so all those who think it was asa2 so if she has hypertension which is like uh, 160 by 90 or 180 by 110 it places her at class 3 which is untreated or maybe she would be treated with magnesium sulfate so we'll take her as class asa class 3 so another thing which i want to educate the uh, residents is about lucas classification so earlier on whenever when we were uh, students we would only understand cesarean section as emergency or elective so now to further uh, understand and make our knowledge more vivid we have come to the this category of classification which says like category 1 category 2 category 3 and category 4 so i'll start from the bottom category 4 would be the one which is elective delivery which is time to suit the women or the staff which is like classically as this like breech presentation at term who are not candidates for vaginal delivery like primary breech or other mal presentations like unstable lie a presentation that fluctuates from oblique cephalic or transverse or twin pregnancy when the first twin is not cephalic like that's a breach so these are the kind of low risk deliveries which will be posted as first on the list whereas if we go back we will see that uh, if category 3 would be particularly the ones which are like um, not progressing to labor no maternal or fetal compromise but needs early delivery a classic example is a patient uh, the mother is not failure to progress for um, labor so category 2 is the one which we very frequently see and that says maternal or fetal compromise that is not immediately life threatening and that would be like fetal 
uh, fetal heart rate changes. So you have to understand whenever, a guy, uh, whenever you get a call, what kind of fetal heart rate race are you seeing? So that's a talk for another session. Like most importantly, you have to understand whether it's a reassuring or a non-reassuring. If it's a reassuring fetal heart rate, so you don't have to worry too much about uh, you know placing your spinal blocks. If it is non-reassuring, you have to know the category of non-reassuring because there are some which pose immediate threat to the life of the fetus, like fetal bradycardia. So those are the ones which, which require immediate attention and maybe performance of general anesthesia. Or there's the last one is category one. Some people call it crash cesarean section also. Like you have to immediately uh, anesthetize the patient for cesarean section. Classically would be cord prolapse or a bleeding patient, like massively bleeding patient where you don't have any time. So these are the categories you have to know before uh, you do your cesarean sections. So we also must be very uh, upfront with now pre-operative evaluation assessment. We should not take that these are young women and there is we will do the PSE on table only. So focus pre-anesthesia evaluation should include a review of maternal obstetric and anesthetic history. Like you should know whether patient had any hypertension, whether she has any low platelets, any, any concern about her previous anesthetic history for difficult airway. So you have to take a proper anesthetic evaluation just as you do for other um, scenarios. So baseline heart rate and BP measurements are very important because you are going to base your further uh, hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamic management based on these baseline measurements. I will be telling you what are those uh, target blood pressures which you have to maintain. A general systemic evaluation with a special focus on cardiovascular and, and respiratory system. It's extremely important because sometimes we do miss um, murmurs in these women as they would, they would not be evaluated thoroughly like the Western world. So many times we come to know that patient has got mitral stenosis on our first visit and uh, which happens classically in the second stage of labor. So it is very important to evaluate cardiovascular and respiratory system in these patients. Detailed evaluation of the airway and spine and review of relevant and case-specific blood investigations need to be done. So preoperative preparation also includes fasting uh, instructions, aspiration prophylaxis, prophylactic antibiotics, arrangement of blood and blood products, securing a proper intravenous access and fluids and how you should transporting the parturion to the operating room. So the next question would be, if a patient, pregnant patient is posted for elective cesarean section, out of all these, uh, which is not true, eat full meal at night, needs to fast for six to eight hours, can take clear fluids till two hours, or she has to be nil per orally strictly throughout till, the, till she is... Uh, uh, out, out of the operation theater. So I request everybody to post their answers on the chat box. I'm asking for the wrong answer. Ma'am, we have some uh, few of them saying that uh, can take clear fluids still to us. I can read it. I can read it. I can read it. Yes, ma'am. So we have got a mixed response. Uh, so we need to clarify it during uh, the course of our lecture. And uh, some, some of our friends are, um, students are mentioning that uh, A is wrong, eat full meal at night. There are some who are saying four is wrong. And there are some also who are uh, saying that six to eight hours is wrong. And uh, there is uh, one person who says that three is wrong. So I'll answer it through the course of my lecture, but as of now, just to brief, just to answer it very shortly, it's strict, strict and nil per oral is the wrong answer because women are allowed to take clear fluids till two hours, 
according to the latest practice guidelines and they uh, need to fast for solids for 6 to 8 hours but if they're early on in the night they can eat their full meal so there is no restriction on this last question the last answer that is nil per oral strictly so we are not on strict, uh, strictly nil per oral these days so pulmonary aspiration of gastric contents is a serious complication and we all know that happens because of altered function of lower esophageal sphincter which is due to the displacement of gravid uh, displacement by the gravid uterus of the stomach and also due to the hormonal effects of progesterone which relaxes the lower esophageal sphincter so i have already said that that uh, fasting of 6 to 8 hours is uh, recommended and clear fluids more than 2 hours uh, if uh, before that you can take as much clear fluids as you want because clear fluids they pass off uh, through the stomach as they do for, for the non pregnant women there is no difference between the two so how did we come to know about this risk of aspiration you can see classically this kind of x rays were seen uh, way back in, uh, in 1866 and uh, you can see this was classically known as the mendelson syndrome and the uh, this article is the oldest article which sort of alerted us that pregnant women can aspirate during delivery if they are not fasted and this happens for the solids and liquids and this was diagnosed in 66 women in a series of cases published by none other than dr mendelson so i put this slide as i feel like this is a very important um, paper through which we came to know that the risk of aspiration is uh, very high if if the patient is not kept fasted just a minute so we have already talked about the how the altered stomach axis and intragastric pre pressures they increase because of the growing baby and the there is a decrease esophageal sphincter tone also gastric emptying is delayed if there is patient is laboring due to the anxiety and pain of labor and if we are using opioids by any route so that should also alert us that this patient is at risk of delayed gastric emptying these are the factors which will determine determine delayed gastric emptying so classically we know there are three drugs like there is a sodium hydrogen citrate which is less available in india we have metoclopramide and ranitidine metoclopramide is a prokinetic which hastens gastric emptying and ranitidine is an h2 blocker whereas uh, this this uh, sodium citrate is indicated in a volume of 30 ml if a patient is being taken for emergency cesarean section because it neutralizes it alkalinizes the ph so this is indicated in emergency section for elective and in our setup we are using mostly metoclopramide so this study i took from um, one of our uh, Lower develop, uh, developing country Ethiopia, where they have also like uh, like our setup, they use ranitidine and uh, or cimetidine. Sodium citrate is used less, whereas metoclopramide is extensively used. In our uh, setup, we are prescribing ranitidine and metoclopramide. So to sum to sum it up, even practice guidelines for obstetric anesthesia, which was given in 2016, they say that preoperative fasting should be as per. Uh, six to eight hours and more than two hours allowed for liquids for labor analgesia protocols women are allowed to take a light meal or clear fluids if they do not have any other risk factor like obesity or they are at high risk for cesarean section say for example a severely preeclamptic is uh, laboring in those cases you need to be uh, careful in what um, what you prescribe them for them for uh, uh, taking during the labor so it is a mandatory thing to administer pharmacological aspiration prophylaxis. And we should also do rapid sequence induction and intubation for which I'll be talking ahead. As a newer tool, we have, we have now gastric ultrasonography, which is called point of care bedside gastric sonography in term pregnant patients. This study was done uh, to, to see how much is the uh, fluid in the stomach which is graded as grade zero, grade one, or grade two. So for this, the woman has to be uh, uh, slightly semi-recumbent, and uh, then she has to be placed in the right lateral position. And you can see uh, how the gastric entrum looks if there is no fluid. And if there is uh, some grade one, like there is evidence of some particulate matter. So this is how it appears. And if it is like fully 
obliterated the gastric antrum so you can make out that this patient has got a grade 2 antrum so this is a new thing if you are uh, using your ultrasound you may also use this to identify if your patient is at risk of aspiration so prophylactic antibiotics they reduce the risk of post cesarean endometritis surgical site infections and urinary tract infections and american college of obstetrics and gynecology recommends narrow spectrum antibiotics 30 minutes before skin incision and mostly it is like uh, either first uh, generation cephalosporin which is uh, most commonly prescribed at my institute or it can be ampicillin so we should also arrange for blood and blood products if the patient is at risk of peripartum hemorrhage uh, like advanced maternal age or there is a bleeding disorder or anticoagulation or patient is a case of increased parity with abnormal presentation and abnormal placentation placental abruptio or premature rupture of membrane or precipitous labor prolonged labors fetal malpres malpresentations retained products of conceptions chorioamnionitis or fetal demise these are risks of peripartum hemorrhage where uh, you should have blood in hand otherwise for a routine elective cesarean section a cross match is sufficient along with that for a safer patient outcome i will request all the residents to review reports of ultrasound uh, uh, images of placentation that will give you a clue uh, whether the there is anything abnormal there you should also develop a communication with your transfusion medicine department because if the patient bleeds massively they can assist you in transporting shock packs you should also be keen to develop in your own center blood and fluid warming devices and a system to deliver fast infusions it it may not be a rapid infusion system you may even have pressure bags or um, if you have rapid infusion that would be the best so when you are transporting the parturion to the theater you must uh, remember to avoid aortic cable compression and maternal supine hypotension syndrome which manifests after 20th week of gestation it reflects in the uterus as abnormal uterine artery velocity uh, velocity waveform especially in non reshortening fetal heart crises all parturients must be placed in left lateral position or supine with a 15 degree left uterine displacement with a pillow under the right hip that's a good practice to save your, to save the patient from maternal spine hypertension syndrome so initially when you start you can start the cesarean section uh, an elective one with a 20 to 22 gauge catheter uh, if there is no uh, risk of you know intra part in, uh, intra cesarean delivery um, bleeding however if uh, there is one then you have to use like white bore catheters central venous catheters are preferred only if difficult iv access are, is there or you require to do multiple blood transfusions or you need to administer vasoactive infusions and usg guided right igv is preferred uh, than left because right is you know simpler and straighter so a well functioning intravenous access is crucial for a cesarean section so operating room preparation and monitoring should also be established so you you must ensure that there is a dedicated ot which is pro in proximity to the labor ward it should be equipped for safe provision of neurexal and general anesthesia and you should be uh, having equipment which can manage complications like failed intubation major obstetric hemorrhage maternal collapse or cardiopulmonary arrest so there should also be equipment for the care of newborn like there should be a separate warmer oxygen source suction and neonatal airway equipment in the operating room you must establish the standard uh, asa monitoring uh, which is recommended by um, and endorsed by our isa guidelines as well that ecg non invasive blood pressure pulse oximetry capnography oxygen and anesthetic agent analyzer ventilator and workstation airway management should include face mask of various sizes oral or nasopharyngeal airways laryngoscope blades and handles endotracheal tubes especially smaller size with with the stilets and supraglottic airway device should always be kept handy because it figures in into the difficult airway algorithm and in case you fail to secure through endotracheal tube you can always insert a supraglottic airway device and um, manage the case there should be a suction with tubing and catheter there should be availability of ambu bag and difficult airway cart which includes equipment for emergency front of neck access 
for potential hemorrhage as, we, as we've already talked large bore peripheral venous catheters fluid warmers pressure bags and automated infusion devices would be a good practice for anesthetic techniques for cesarean section uh, we know that we are we do general anesthesia as well as uh, central neural axle anesthesia and uh, techniques uh, however central neural axle techniques are the preferred techniques because they allow the mother to be awake and enjoy a birthing experience so coming to central neural techniques so single shot spinals uh, are the most preferred ones they are simplest and the safest and the quickest to be to be performed patient can be positioned either sitting or lateral and we have to ensure sterile asepsis we can use chlorhexidine or uh, betadine we have to drape the patient operator should be scrubbed operator should also don mask and gown and surgical cap midline approach is the best surface landmarks are L3 to L4 interspace or below. You can use a 25 to 27 gauge Quinky or Whitaker. If Whitaker is available, that would be good as it has got a pencil point and it avoids uh, cutting of the dura. It splits the dural fibers and is less uh, associated with post-dural puncture headache. The drugs which are used classically are hyperbaric 0.5 milligram bupivacaine and recommended doses are 10 to 12 milligrams. I'll be talking more about this in the uh, in the future slides. We can add fentanyl in uh, in Western countries. They add diamorphine or morphine in addition to fentanyl for post-operative analgesia. But if you are not very comfortable with using either of the two lower drugs, diamorphine is not available to us. But if morphine is available, I will not recommend if you have never used one before without in a proper setup. Combined spinal epidural anesthesia provides rapid and dense sensory motor blockage, and it has an added advantage of augmenting duration of anesthesia by administering drugs through epidural catheter. So say if your patient is a high risk, say, uh, say a patient has got you know, peripartum cardiomyopathy or patient is a case of heart disease. So these te this technique comes handy, or if you're using a very low dose, then this technique comes handy because then you can initiate your uh, spinal anesthesia with a small dose and then you can augment by utilizing epidural, epidural catheter. Epidural anesthesia is not very commonly used as a sole anesthetic technique for cesarean section. It is mostly as a conversion of labor epidural to surgical anesthesia when uh, we use labor epidurals. Uh, uh, the choice of local anesthetic and volume of epidural drug depends on the urgency. Like you can use 2% lignocaine in case it's an um, urgent C-section uh, because that actually acts very fast. And uh, you have to be very careful in administering drugs. So bas basically, I would say that you use uh, helicots of local anesthetic and rather than giving a stat bolus. So you give every five, two to three minutes, five ml, and you can um, grade it up. So technically speaking, single shot spinals are the easiest and they are associated with ra rapid onset of dense block and they require lowest dose of local anesthetic uh, with opioid. How however, they have limited duration of anesthesia. Epidural is not associated with dural puncture, hence there is no risk of PDPH. And you can also titrate the extent of sensory blockage. You can extend the duration of intraoperative anesthesia and postoperative analgesia. However, it has slow to act Larger doses uh, uh, of local anesthetics are required and in-situ catheter can interfere with the initiation of post-operative thromboprophylaxis. CAC is technically easier uh, than spinal anesthesia in obese parturients because then you are very sure that you have hit the space and you can use very low doses of local anesthetics with opioids. It has got a rapid onset of dense block and again you can uh, you know extend the block if you want if the case is going on for long through the epidural. However, uh, it can also delay verification of epidural catheter because you have injected the drug and the test catheter remains untested. And the in situ catheter can interfere with post operative thromboprophylaxis. So I'll uh, push another question. So, if you have to do spinal anesthesia, so surgical anesthesia will require a sensory block height till.
Ma'am, majority of them say T4. Yeah. So that's correct, actually. So we'll be answering in the subsequent slide why T4. So it's right. Those who are on a lower uh, level, they should also correct their clinical practices. And uh, T4 of sensory block is the one which is required for surgical anesthesia. So T4 is optimal. T4 to T6 is adequate. Above T4 is excessive. Below T6 is insufficient. So we have to understand why we are, uh, uh, you know, concentrating on this point. Uh, we have to understand that although the supply of uterus is from T10, we need to go higher up because there are visceral inputs from the higher segments. So whenever there is overstretching of round ligament during surgery, or there's a fundal pressure, or there is a need to exteriorize the uterus, deliver the momentum of bowel into the wounds, Sometimes uh, there is a need to check fallopian tubes and ovaries. Sometimes you have to go deeper into the paracolic gutters. And there is also at times, you know, there is a subdiaphragmatic irritation due to blood and amniotic fluid. All these things, if they're not adequately addressed, then patient can have intraoperative pain. And intraoperative pain can initiate a cascade of adverse events like nausea and vomiting, which is simply not desirable. So that is the reason we need to go a little higher up. So when you test your level of block, you have to understand that T10 is for skin incision, fennel skin incision for cesarean section. T4 dermatome, you have to check for no cold sensation, but T5 to touch. If the block is less than T5, your patient is going to continuously whimper for dull, aching, visceral type of pain for the reasons I've told you earlier. So it's very important that T4 to no cold sensation and T5 to touch should be ensured before you give a go ahead do wait and till you do, do not attain these levels, do not allow for a, uh, you know, that forceps thing is really now out. So the touching of the skin with the forceps and picking it up and giving pain to the uh, mother is not advocated anymore. So use ice blocks, use uh, eth uh, ethyl alcohol to check for the, teeth, for the sensory block, or you can do a light touch with those um, blunted needles uh, for bilateral symmetrical block. So what is the current evidence on spinal dosing? So current evidence on spinal dosing says uh, you can go low on the dose, you can use CSC and you, you should use adjuvants. So if I ask the audience once again, what do you think would be a low dose for spinal anesthesia for cesarean section? Would it be 12 to 15 milligrams of heavy bupivacaine? 10 to 12, 8 to 10 or 5 to 9? So I'll open the poll again. So I am uh, observing that uh, most of our audience feels 10 to 12 milligrams. More, many of them believe 8 to 10 8 milligrams. To 10. And I haven't got any answer for 5 to 8. One person is saying 5 to 8. So we'll be answering this question. And uh, because if you do not know what is low dose, and we are talking about give a low dose, then I think um, the purpose is uh, defeated. So. This was one study which brought about this change. It's a very early study, 2000, uh, probably two, Choi et al. So they took 100 patients for elective cesarean section and they subjected one group to a low dose CSC. That is, they gave bupivacaine 6 milligram with a fentanyl and epidural top up. And the second was a single shot with bupivacaine 9 milligram with 20 micrograms of fentanyl. And what they observed was that hypotension was significantly more in women who received 9 milligrams of bupivacaine and intraoperative nausea vomiting due to hypotension was also more statistically significant. You can see here the p-values. They were significantly more if we used 9 milligrams. So this, this is, so 9 milligram is definitely not a low dose. So low dose spinal anesthesia, this article, which is a you know review article, has given us that doses of intrathecal bupivacaine between five to seven milligrams are sufficient to provide effective anesthesia. And if you're using such low doses, you always need to have a catheter backup. 
so the answer for that question was 5 to 9 milligrams is a low dose anything above that is a high dose anything below that is a very low dose so very low doses are recommended only for labor analgesia that 1 to 2 milligrams when we use 5 to 9 milligrams those are typically low doses but they should be backed up with a catheter because the effect of these drugs they last only for 45 minutes if the cesarean section happens uh, to pro get prolonged then your patient is going to experience pain so be very careful when you are doing a low dose so in order to avoid or reduce the incidence of failure as i have already said you add an opioid people also add clonidine but i have personally no experience with clonidine i have i'm very fond of using 7.5 to 8 mg with 20 micrograms of fentanyl it works well as far as uh, surgical anesthesia is concerned and also hemodynamic stability is concerned if you are uh, if you can use a csc technique where extension and modification of block is possible so do go ahead and use a epidural catheter judiciously even for post operative pain management do check the block height achieved with loss of touch to t4 i'm repeating so still having done all this there can be episodes of uh, you know incomplete block so it can go wrong at many places it can go wrong after you do lp when you inject the solution or there is a difficult there is a you know diffuse spread of the drug or unilateral spread of the drug then the drug action on the target sites and then subsequent patient management so you have to know where you are going wrong at what stage so i would like to draw your attention to this uh, needle which we can see has to be very much into the epidural space because of its short bevel and this is a pencil point needle even in quinkies you can face this problem if your bevel is not well into the arachnoid space you can have a drip of uh, csf which is not free flowing and and if you inject then half the la seeps out into the epidural space and you get a patchy effect you may not even get effect if uh, your needle is 3/4 out into the epidural space or the fluid leaks into the subdural space you can have a very high um, spinal block so you have to be very careful when you inject the drug that i tell my residents is a rate limiting step you should ensure there is a free flow of csf into your uh, syringe and once the free flow is there only then inject the drug if you are not getting a free flow kindly detach your syringe check for your bevel position again and then go ahead with it so if you are not getting the desired effect do you want to repeat the spinal be aware that if you repeat the spinal injection you may land up into a high or total spinal and you may, you should also look at the airway of the patient you should also look at uh, what is the increased risk of pdph or neural damage you should see in totality before you start repeating uh, your spinal also remember that we people can takes 15 to 20 minutes for the full effect so just don't rush it so how do you define failed spinal failed spinal is the one in which a woman complains of pain during surgery first and foremost start developing the habit of listening to the woman don't think that if she is complaining she is only malingering or it's only a bit it doesn't matter you have to appreciate her level of anxiety and pain and address it appropriately so it's very very important to do that so if you have to convert it to ga if you have to convert it to any other form of anesthesia say you are administering a you know your inhalational or you are adding on some ketamine so those are called failed spinals you are, you do not you have the inability to achieve a defined degree of nerve block like the one which you talk about t4 level so what are the options if you do fail in your spinal so you have to see at what level it has failed after skin incision but before 30 minutes so you have got a long way to go better to go ahead with general anesthesia after skin incision more than 30 minutes try to revive or salvage the block see if you oxygen and nitrous help you see if uh, ketamine in the doses of 0.1 to 0.1 to 0.25 help you out or a little bit of fentanyl wound in infiltration change in position valsalva you can try some maneuvers but if it has happened 
before the incision, a quick attempt at the repeat block set or prepare for GA. If it is before incision, but more than 30 minutes have elapsed, you're not getting any effect. You have to repeat the block, but be very careful about the patient's characteristics as well and the logistics around you. I would say go ahead with a combined spinal epidural where you can do a small amount of spinal anesthesia and you can uh, top it up with your epidural catheter. But do not forget to wait for an adequate time after spinal anesthetic, first spinal anesthetic before you attempt uh, your spinal drill. Next, I come to a very important topic that is maternal spinal hypotension. It is absolutely undesirable to have a mother vomiting and feeling nauseated. It is almost like a poor standard of care if your mother is complaining of nausea and vomiting. Maternal hypotension can also cause decreased uteroplacental blood flow and lead to fetal acidosis. It can also lead to cardiovascular collapse if not treated timely. So that is a written rarely. So the initial management of post-spinal hypotension consists of uh, giving IV crystalloids. We'll be talking about what is a co-loading versus pre-loading. Ensure left uterine tilt to preserve uteroplacental circulation. You can augment venous return by elevating the foot end of the operating table, not head down, as it can uh, cause the spread of the local anesthetic cephaloid. Graded compression stockings have been used. Pneumatic compression devices have also been used in conjunction with fluids and drugs, not alone. So if you talk about vasopressors, we know there are drugs of choice, like we are using ephedrine and filinephrin. We'll be talking a little more about these. And you should also have atropine handy if there is any symptomatic bradycardia. So when you talk about co-load and preload and choice of fluids, this is one article which came in Canadian Journal of Anesthesia in 2012, and it was given by a Lubert et al. So what they have told us is, if you give fluid administration prior to a spinal anesthesia, that's called preloading. And what is co-loading? Fluid administration starting at the time of administration of spinal anesthesia together. So preloading is not preferred these days. However, if you, for some reason, you're choosing colloid, then a colloid preload can be given because that is associated with less hypotension, reduced vasopressor requirement, maintenance of cardiac output, and less nausea. The best combination would be a crystalloid colloid because that also gives us the same kind of uh, outcomes as with colloids. Crystalloids are a better bet when given as a co-load. So if you have not changed your practice, please preload has no meaning with crystalloids. Preload has a meaning with colloids, but what would be most beneficial and standard of care would be crystalloid co-load. And typically it happens as 10 to 15 mils per kg body weight. If you talk about vasopressors, we have got a whole range. We have got ephedrine, phenylephrine, metaraminol, noradrenaline, adrenaline, and mefentramine. In India, most of the places we are using mefentramine, which is like uh, indirect, immediate uh, acting vasopressor. And most of the studies and the evidence-based literature focuses on the use of ephedrine and phenylephrine. So if we are giving a lecture, we would go more on evidence-based than our clinical practice. Evidence is... Why I say evidence-based? Because ephedrine has been studied extensively. It started with a, you know, um, in a sheep model in which the authors found that with increasing blood pressures, or uh, ephedrine was the only drug which maintained uteroplacental blood flow. So this was the drug of choice for many, many years. However, because of its direct beta sympathomimetic effects on the baby, uh, people started preferring uh, phenylephrine to ephedrine. So the next literature which came to us throughout our 2000, um, 2005 onwards till now focuses on the use of phenylephrine. And lately we have started focusing on noradrenaline also, but noradrenaline has a burden of proof. It is still undergoing trials. So I'll be focusing on uh, the use of phenylephrine uh, more than ephedrine. So as I've already said that ephedrine Ephedrine has a delayed onset of action and long duration of action. So when you are 
titrating your blood pressures to a goal it sometimes becomes difficult to bring up the pressure it takes time for it to act in that short time the mother becomes uh, you know hypotensive and she vomits so that is a disadvantage you do not want a drug which has got a late onset of action so larger doses are required for uh, you know giving um, a, this kind of um, you know a targeted blood pressure so that indicates it has got a lower efficacy and if you keep on giving repeated doses there is a chance of uh, tachypyrexis and if you give a larger dose uh, it can stimulate beta sympathetic activity which can promote pitral acidosis so this brings us to phenylephrine so why should i use phenylephrine phenylephrine is more effective it is pure alpha agonist vasoconstrictor it is faster in onset than ephedrine shorter duration easy to titrate like if you can you can run an infusion of uh, phenylephrine also and it is very easy to titrate because of its uh, fast action and short duration it is associated with best maternal neonatal outcome in the sense it is associated with lower in incidence of intraoperative nausea vomiting and higher umbilical artery ph so lower incidence of pitral acidosis this study was given by the author nanki et al who is the stalwart behind initiating this change in um, vasopressor management and he told us that patients if you give a you know 100 micrograms of phenylephrine as a bolus dose and target the baseline blood pressure that gave us the best management for the for the mother no intraoperative nausea vomiting and good fetal outcomes so from his study we started realizing that women need to be targeted to their baseline values and not treated when the blood pressure falls to less than 80 or 90% of the baseline so whenever that again we go back to the first slide where i had said that know your baseline blood pressure and heart rates and know that i have to start treating if the blood pressure falls below this so always have an objective in mind so that this is the this is one landmark study and the other landmark study which told us that how much of ed95 is required to prevent spinal induced hypotension here the author took 50 elective cesarean section for subarachnoid blockage with 12 mg of uh, hyperbaric bupivacaine with 100 mg of uh, morphine and they used a double blind up down sequential uh, method to know what is the optimum dose of phenylephrine so they started with the 40 micrograms and they increased with uh, every 10 increments and as you see they were juggling between the doses and they found that once they reach 120 micrograms mother the blood pressures are maintained so this gave us the dose of 90 to 100 micrograms uh, for um, for treating maternal hypotension so this is one schedule which i have took taken uh, this has come from columbia university of medical center and they say that if your patient's blood pressure is maintained at baseline you can switch off the phenylephrine infusion what exactly what i told you two slides back try to target baseline blood pressure if blood pressure is between 90 to 99% of baseline keep the infusion on at 50 micrograms if it is 80 to 89 100 micrograms and if it is less than 80 you need to treat it aggressively and if it is not responding you can also use ephedrine uh, in, <clears throat> when should i start using phenylephrine i would say prevention is better than treatment so start immediately after intrathecal drug administration just as coload this should be also co administered a small bolus and then you run the infusion because we want to target the baseline blood pressure so talking about spinal anesthesia it seems very simple but sometimes there are many complications which are unforeseen so we have to be aware and be aware of these complications and i'll start with the simplest one because we all think that spinal anesthesia is a, is a routine affair and there is nothing which is dangerous but let me tell you the skin asepsis itself can be dangerous because if we are using iodine we are uh, sort of we are lucky because it's a color coded thing but if we are using chlorhexidine chlorhexidine is a clear uh, clear solution and there have been instances where people have injected inadvertently chlorhexidine into the subarachnoid space 
so chlorhexidine is a neurotoxic and if it is even uh, even if a, if a drop of it reaches meninges it causes meningitis and if it is in uh, you know some uh, larger volume it can lead to permanent uh, neurological damage so we have to be very careful about it and uh, the safety guidelines issued in nsc in 2014 clearly mentioned that if you are using uh, chlorhexidine you should be very meticulous in taking measures to prevent it from reaching the cerebrospinal fluid another thing which we have to be very uh, upfront and very careful about is the drug administration errors we have read so many articles where uh, in haste due to fatigue wrong uh, night hours and single person doing the cesarean section we do have instances where people have injected wrong drugs and the most notorious one is tranexamic acid so look alike read alike uh, you know drug ampules should be uh, should be handled very carefully so this article has also given us uh, four points the first is careful reading of the label on any drug ampule or syringe before the drug is drawn up or injected labeling of all syringes is mandatory check labels with the second person or a device we don't have a barcode reader linked to a computer so we should have a second person who reads it out again before the drug is drawn up and administered and use of non lure lock connectors on all epidural spinal and combined uh, spinal epidural devices so this was recommendation given in nsc annual reason 2015 for patient safety measures so if you have a difficulty in placing spinal and patient is in extreme stress don't get distressed yourself we have all been been there many times even i have i faced so many times a failure in putting spinal anesthesia if you are sweating after 20 to 60 minutes of efforts do call for help sometimes it is always better to give up than to keep on trying and putting the patient into further distress also achieve patient rapport and cooperation again demonstrate the posture reinforce positioning patient straightens up over time when in pain so you have to just check for all these points to achieve success what about ultrasound yes if you know how to you can always use ultrasound in such difficult scenarios to identify the midline depth to ligamentum flavum and spinal rotation if present so if by chance your patient lands up into high spinal it's a very very detrimental stage because patient feels like patient is dying and it has been variably described on google like anyone else feel like they couldn't breathe during c section i felt terrified i so patient have really given i was so scared of getting the feeling that i can't breathe so these are the things which people have expressed on uh, google so we all know this happens if there is a blockage of t1 to t4 which is associated with vasodilated hands further reduction of uh, systemic vascular resistance and then there could be a horner syndrome and there could be a bradycardia so we should be very upfront in uh, managing these cases we should not get psyched out we should also know what are those risk factors which are associated with high neuroaxial block like obesity spinal technique after failed epidural anesthesia a short heighted person epidural after wet tap or a spinal deformity so these are some factors which can give us a clue that these patients are at risk of high neuroaxial anesthesia so you must recognize the situation immediately and act rapidly and with confidence so that the patient doesn't panic too much so you have to say that you are going to be okay this sometimes happens when spinal goes too high i am going to help you breathe so a little assurance goes a long way so if you ever have a situation like this i am asking the audience would you like to tube or would you like to back mask
So, ma'am, we have a divided opinion, I guess. Yeah, I can see that <laughs> because um, actually they are very juxtaposed answers. But immediately, I would go ahead with all those who said back mask ventilation, mm -hmm. and um, because uh, it all depends. But ventilation trumps intubation. Ventilation even trumps aspiration. So my rule of thumb is if there is a loss of consciousness, total apnea, then intubate. But stabilize BP and oxygenation first, even before intubation. So sometimes what happens is once you start bag mask, uh, doing bag mask and you bring up the blood pressure, patient becomes much better. So first intubation should be done only in extreme circumstances. So you should immediately reach back to your machine, pull out bag, uh, your vein circuit and put your hand on the pulse and manage accordingly. So I'll go on to the next section of the talk. I'll talk a bit about general anesthesia for cesarean section. So there are many indications uh, for general anesthesia and among them, uh, the topmost would be strong maternal preference for general anesthesia in the absence of uh, factors that predict a difficult airway. Uh, then failure to cooperate for neurexal block. There is a psychiatric disorder, developmental delays, emotional ability, local skin, in skin infections, or there is a comorbid condition that would contraindicate a neurexal technique like coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, severe uncorrected hypovolemia or hemorrhage, SERS, sepsis, or there is inadequate time to induce neurexal anesthesia like in category one cesarean section, we talked about it, fetal cord prolapse. Failure of neurexal technique like uh, multiple needle placements and failure patchy or inadequate block. And otherwise our technique of choice remains spinal anesthesia. So since uh, there, are, there are limited indications for uh, anest uh, general anesthesia, we have seen that general anesthesia rates are pretty low. They are about 6%. And that also poses a problem and that we are not very accustomed to doing general anesthesia in cesarean sections. And many of our trainees do not get to do general anesthesia in more than a handful of patients because of the same reason. You can see the UK trends for cesarean section till 2010. Here also they have seen that general anesthesia has sort of started declining, and um, more of uh, you know cesarean, more of spinal anesthesia is coming up. And pr pr probably this is because uh, one first and foremost we prefer spinal anesthesia. Second is if the patient is laboring, she already has an in situ catheter, so it would be good to top up that catheter rather than doing a general anesthesia. In case you are doing general anesthesia, you have to remember that you have to plan, prepare, and then perform. Because failure to prepare is preparing to fail in this case. Among the potential problems of general anesthesia, one of the topmost is awareness. I've already talked about aspiration in the previous section. So I'm going ahead with awareness. And this was uh, you know, written by this article on your uh, screen an editorial on being aware was written by a patient who has given her experience as to what was happening to her when she was lying still without any anesthetic agent into her body. She could feel everything. She could feel somebody was, uh, you know, going through her body in, and reaching out for her, you know, her visceral organs. And she didn't like it a bit. It created uh, so much of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in her that she has written this article way back in 1979. And why this happens? Because most of us anesthetists, we are scared about low APGAR scores of the baby. We do not want the baby to be floppy like this. We want that the baby should be active and should be handed over to the mother as soon as possible. So in order to give a, you know, um, crying baby to the mother, we end up doing less on our anesthetic agents. And that creates awareness, which is simply not desirable. So the factors related to accidental awareness also include females, younger age, obesity, difficult airway, maternal anxiety, increased cardiac output, and hence the fast washout of the drugs or redistribution of the drugs. So also induction agents, because we use them at fixed doses because of rapid sequence induction. We use neuromuscular blockage with fixed doses. And then we are worried about the effect on the baby. We are also worried about the anesthetic agents affecting the uterine tone. 
also if there's a trainee at the head end and the, it is out of office hours emergency we are worried about a short long induction to incision uh, all these factors they contribute to accident, accidental in, awareness so if we talk about the two induction agents we have thiopental sodium and we have propofol and we know when we administer both the drugs they get redistributed so what happens is once you inject the drug there is an increased concentration of the anesthetic agent and then there is an exponential decay and then you, as you are uh, switching on your inhalational agent which are taking up and coming up to the mac value there is one point where one do dose is declining and the other is just beginning to pick up and this is the time when the patient sort of has this awareness issues so when you do your induction agents you have to mind the gap to avoid awareness so aaga stands for accidental awareness uh, following general anesthesia so a comparison of the two drugs showed us that if you use 5 mg or 2.4 mg of propofol uh, so patients were in light anesthesia in 50% of propofol group as assessed by eeg and if we see the other studies through uh, 2015 we see that 2 mg per kg gives bis value significantly lower in propofol group so all in all propofol wins over thiopentone we have to remember that if you want to mind the gap always keep a second syringe of propofol loaded because you are going to turn on your inhalational agents a little later and the concentration of that takes time to build up so it's a good idea to have a second syringe always loaded and kept with you and administered in such situations if you talk about babies again it has been seen that with pro propofol apgar scores and neonatal outcomes were better uh, with propofol than with thiopentone so the recommendations uh, are to see the risk and then uh, take the consent accordingly if there is a risk and you do not want to give a deeper plane so you have to take the consent you have to do your induction doses additional doses if there is an airway problem should be kept ready as i have already shown you and you should also aim at end tidal volatile levels which i'll be showing you use opioids use nitrous oxide use of eutotonic agents and avoid drug errors so if you talk about uterine tone so we all know that we are uh, worried about the relaxant effects of all inhalational agents so because they inhibit spontaneous contractility in a dose dependent manner sevoflurane and desflurane and halothane are equal but isoflurane does it uh, to a lower degree maintain the mac 1 to 1.5 rather than 0.8 till baby is delivered to prevent accidental awareness of uh, gen during general anesthesia once delivered you can supplement with opioid midazolam or teva if you want to use opioids for cesarean delivery for pressure responses mainly you have to understand that the baby may uh, may be delivered in a, with low apgar scores you have to alert your neonatologist however people are using dexmedetomidine uh, and remifentanil for mothers who require um, to uh, bl to blunt their pressure responses in, for cesarean section all the both these drugs have been proven to be safe if given uh, in adequate doses however if repeated doses are required then respiratory depression can be a problem in the baby so securing maternal airway is also a very concerning because we all know that incidence of obstetric failed tracheal intubation is very high and uh, one in one one in 224 has been reported that is failure to achieve during uh, intracranial intubation during a rapid sequence induction for obstetric anesthesia thereby initiating a failed intubation drill and difficult intubation is eight times more difficult than non pregnant mask ventilations are also as difficult as high as 15.5% which can lead to loss of airway and this can lead to anesthesia related mortality and medical legal litigations so why is pregnant airway difficult because of the altered anatomy airway edema weight gain in large breasts full dentition and the physiological changes like decreased frc increased oxygen consumption and low esophageal uh, sphincter tone is decreased so again a question to the audience 
do you think malampati grade changes during labor and delivery Ma'am, the majority says yes. Yeah, so majority says yes, and I agree with the majority. Malam Pati grade does change during labor and delivery, and this was mm -hmm. first uh, shown to us by none other than our um, Dr. Kodali, who is an Indian who is uh, chief of obstetric anesthesia at Maryland, USA. In a very renowned paper, he studied Malam Pati um, grades in a normally normally laboring patient. and they found that there is a class change in labor in these women so this is basically because of the you know fluid retention they are on oxytocin and they do lots of well salva so there is a class change so whenever a patient is if you examine a patient she is malampatti 1 there she may land up into malampatti 2 depending upon the duration of labor in a study in my own center we also found that these changes happen rapidly in preeclamptic parturients this was a prospective case control study and uh, i would like to stress that preeclamptic parturients they experience shorter labors because most of the times due to fetal heart rate changes they are wheeled into labor uh, labor flows for labor for cesarean section much earlier than a normal parturient so in 6 hours you may see the malam score malam patti score increases from Uh, by one class in these patients as compared their non normal tensive parts in addition malampati airway changes also occur if you happen to have a bleeding patient whom you have resuscitated aggressively this was a case report in a canadian journal of anesthesia in 2000 and uh, this is again because when you give large volume resus Uh, they are susceptible for developing tissue edema because of the intravenous fluid infusion of fluids that and we we all know that pregnant women have decreased colloid osmotic oncotic pressures as well so if the such a patient comes or you have to do intraoperative conversion to ga there is a reexploration please be aware that there will be a class change of malam patti here also so gravid uterus pushes the diaphragm we all know you can see the diagram uh, on the screen how frc decreases to more than 20 to 30% and uh, more and when the patient lies supine it worsens and then it also worsens if patient is obese so 30 to 50% parturients they have their closing capacities um, lowered uh, more than frcs so placent this increased oxygen consumption happens because of fetal and placental oxygen demands which increases by 20% at term also increases with painful contractions if the woman has come to you after uh, experiencing labor and not received epidural analgesia this will be further a cause of increased oxygen uh, demand and decreased apnea time you know if the patient has got decreased frc and increased oxygen consumption it decreases the time to uh, to uh, desaturation so the women the desaturate to less than 90 degrees in no time and if this patient also comes for category 1 section or patient has a failed spinal you need to acquire the rep, uh, airway rapidly there's a performance pressure decreased time for pre oxygenation equipment is not available it's a night time you lack expertise then you can land up into more problem so these are the difficulty levels that is why pre operative airway assessment has been made mandatory by the national audit project nap 4 by the united kingdom and they said that poor airway assessment contributes to poor outcome so it should be a part of overall plan of anesthesia if there is a difficulty in in uh, difficult airway anticipated antenatal anesthesia consultations should be sought and evaluate airway on labor floor after admission and before taking up for c section prepare your theater you should have a cart which is neatly labeled like this 
uh, you should put some stickers to identify what is in what uh, drawer because in extreme haste, your cognitive load is very high and it becomes difficult to figure out what is lying where. Head up position in pregnant patient increases FRC, always remember. So decreases, uh, so if you use a short handle, it decreases the impingement caused by large breasts. And this should be preferred then to the standard handle blade. Eight deep breaths over a minute should be advised to the woman because uh, it increases your end tidal oxygenation, which should be targeted at 90%. And this is the gold standard. Cricoid pressure, the DAS guidelines and OA, that is Obstetric Society, UK, suggest that cricoid pressure of 10 newtons is used in a wake patient and increased to 30 newtons in an unconscious patient. You can remove the cricoid pressure if you are not um, able to visualize or you have to insert SAD and it is you are finding it difficult. Whosoever thinks that mask, uh, back mask ventilation should be avoided should uh, revise their uh, guidelines now because mask ventilation can be done with gentle pressure. You should not exceed 20 centimeters of water uh, when you do ma gentle mask ventilation during rapid sequence induction. Video laryngoscopes are coming up uh, now and uh, guidelines are recommending the use of video laryngoscope as the first line of management. In all labor room uh, suites and labor room theaters, we should have a video laryngoscope available because video laryngoscopes are associated with better CL grades, higher success rates, and it is advocated as a rescue device in failed intubation drill. Also, it's a good teaching tool because if you, the, you know, the teacher can look at the screen and guide the student accordingly. And therefore, it is associated with better uh, you know, logistics. We must also make our own checklists uh, for uh, cesarean sections as well as for the rapid sequence induction checklist, like uh, preparing the patient. We should have um, a script, somebody reading out pre-oxygenation, optimal tight-fitting mask, have I achieved end tidal oxygen more than 0.9, is difficult airway anticipated, is the second experienced person available now, end acid pre-med given, is patient of position optimal, is then Oxford help pillow available, do I need to remove the tilt? So all these things have to be read aloud. It should be a very comprehensive kind of a list, which is conducive to your own setting, but do make one, it doesn't take a long time. Coming up to post-operative analgesia. So it's a significant concern for the parturient because if there is inadequate analgesia, it is a great discomfort to the mother. So she's unable to care for her newborn and uh, there's a delayed discharge from post-anesthesia care unit. So therefore, we recommend a multimodal approach. So when we say multimodal approach, you should use a combination of non-opioid intravenous analgesics like estaminophen, uh, ketrolac, you can uh, also add peripheral nerve blocks like bilateral tap blocks, quadratus lumborum block, or uh, other blocks like ileoinguinal, iliohypogastric, or erectospinal block. Intravenous opioids are uh, used as, uh, in our country, they're mostly used as rescue boluses. Uh, but they, you know, these days we are targeting opioid free uh, or opioid sparing analgesia. So one can go on the first two choices. If you give paracetamol, you can dose the woman with 15 milligram every six thali. Diclofenac can be given one to two milligram per kg eight thali. Tremidol, if you are targeting tremidol, then it can be given as a one milligram per kg IV infusion in 100 ml normal cell line over 15 to 20 minutes. Be sure that you dilute it because it is associated with nausea and vomiting, uh, which you need to treat with ondansetron. If you use morphine, it can be given in a dose of 0.1 milligram per kg IV for a severe post-operative pain not controlled by the above drugs. But remember to be, um, to be uh, watchful of the side effects like drowsiness, nausea, vomiting, respiratory depression, and hence such kind of patients, they require monitoring. A word about enhanced recovery after surgery. So what is enhanced recovery after surgery and that is cesarean section? It's a multidisciplinary program using evidence-based practices across all phases of care. That is the pre, the post, 
in uh, in top and post op uh, all phases to promote healing and recovery after surgery so right from the hospital uh, from from the admission to surgery then nursing care and then um, clinical staff lactation anesthesia baby everything comes into uh, play and it happens right from pre admission to intraop to post op and it focuses on uh, faster healing and better patient care shorter length of stay like how can you prevent surgical site infection you prevent hypothermia give antibiotics decrease the surgical stress response by preventing intraoperative nausea vomiting giving good analgesia recovery of bowel means like you allow them to eat early ambulation and optimizing post operative pain so these goals should also be embedded when you do a cesarean section uh, as locally practice allows you so at the end i would say that uh, do pre anesthetic evaluation of a patient for cesarean section categorize the class of cesarean delivery prefer spinal anesthesia as the first line of management and if you do spinal anesthesia maintain hemodynamics prevent intraoperative nausea and vomiting and know how to rescue inadequate spinal block in case you are going to do ga you should be very safe and don't be uh, you know hesitant in calling for help as obstetric airways are deemed to be difficult theater preparedness should be done for such patients and we should also in introduce who checklist into our settings uh, with this i end my uh, presentation and uh, if you want to know more about obstetric anesthesia i'll uh, invite you all to this meeting annual meeting uh, to be held in december between 8 to 11 at pgi chandigarh you can contact me on my gmail uh, for the same so we are going to have uh, renowned faculty speaking about uh, obstetric anesthesia during this 3 uh, and a half days thank you very much and thank you so much for bringing us all uh, we have a lot of queries which have come up for you Yes, can i yes. with your permission yes. can i ask you the questions yes, yes, which have yes. been put up by the audience yes, so ma'am yes. uh, ma'am the first question is will there be a dose variation and level variation when we give spinal in patients sitting up and lying laterally uh there there have been studies to suggest that in sitting uh, there is a there is a one dermatomal or two dermatomal change but it all depends what position you give after you make the patient lie down if you make the patient sit up for too long then the drug settles down because uh, at the you know sacral segments and it doesn't uh, give you a t4 height so ultimately when you do a sitting spinal you lie down the patient immediately and drug takes about 4 uh, to 7 minutes to settle and it till 20 minutes you know the effect comes so i really do not know if we would like to make our um, patient sit up for 20 minutes for uh, in sitting position so right. i don't think it really makes that big a difference ma'am uh, there is a second question can we use levobupivacaine or ropivacaine in pregnant patient and does it avoid hypotension well the studies for both the drugs are under way i have no personal experience to say but all spinal anest all local anesthetics they have the propensity to cause um you know a fall in blood pressure not because of the drug itself but uh, by the spread because but because of the loss of Uh, arterial or tone which occurs after you inject local anesthetic so maybe the spinal hypotension is less pronounced but definitely it is going to be there we cannot say that there will be no spinal hypotension okay i have personally no experience with levobupivacaine and uh, because they have been just introduced into clinical practice in india okay ma'am the second uh, third question is if phenylephrine does not work should we go for noradrenaline basically uh, the practice guidelines recommend ephedrine okay if phenylephrine is not working then ephedrine then go for ephedrine that is the second option we should go so, well, as rescue nor noradrenaline we do not have evidence as of now right ma'am ma'am lehrish uh, dr lehrish would last uh, would like to ask you what is intraoperative shivering uh, and it does not respond to forced air warmers warm iv fluids or iv pethidine So, is uh, hydrocortisone an option for uh, these patients? 
basically this happens because uh, when you do vaso when there is a vasodilatation is extensive vasodilatation there is redistribution of heat so hydrocortisone is not going to help it's not going to help us there so, are some trials which are focusing on ex metrometine right so ma'am there is another question by dr amin he wants to know that uh, if we give very low dose of dopamine can be uh, can it be used for diluting the co loading uh, fluid like 5 to 10 mg of dopamine can be given along with co loading of fluids see we again i will uh, like to stress that we should do evidence based practice if there is a, an evidence to suggest that dopamine is to be used then we can use it there is no such trial this we can do whatever we want to do but we are guided by standard of care standard of care comes through evidence based literature meta analysis systematic reviews and then the practice guidelines so there is nothing to suggest the use of dopamine as of now um uh, ma'am next question by dr lehrish is what are the common causes of intraoperative chest discomfort and headache during lses so chest discomfort can occur as i've already said that there is a we all think that the supply to uterus is by t10 so we we can get away with it but actually there are uh, you know the, the visceral uh, sympathetics are coming from numerous other uh, pathways as well so if your uh, level is inadequate then it can cause chest discomfort or if your level is too high like you are crossing t2 even then there can be breathing difficulty and chest discomfort okay so we have to be very sure when we are taking a patient for high spinal we have to check keep on checking the level also the chest discomfort could be because of the risk oh, so uh, ma'am there's a question by pradyuman he wants to know that back mass ventilation we were discussing about back mass ventilation and tracheal intubation in case if there's a high spinal so we all opted for back mass ventilation before we start so his question is that back mass ventilation can lead to aspiration as patient is considered full stammer so he wants to know what do you say about it so the thing is yes that's a risk factor but mostly once you start, see if there is a total apnea then patient is going to aspirate in that case you have to first and foremost anyways you will hold the bag mask before you intubate you can't intubate straight so what they are trying to say is don't reach out for intubation start anyways you are going to hold the bag mask and then put the tube and most of the times when you give oxygen these patients they come up and there is no need to intubate but if there is total apnea first and foremost you are going to put the bag mask do you do intubation without putting a bag mask we always put a bag we will we'll, we'll put the mask switch the oxygen on and so many times the need to do intubation is averted so that is why they say it trumps over it doesn't say it negates so first is you oxygenate the patient and most of the times some of the time they'll come up if there's a total apnea you can intubate right uh ma'am the next question is in case of general anesthesia or spinal anesthesia is not possible like you cannot give a general anesthesia you cannot give a spinal so would you get a lcs done under local infiltration no never. never why would general anesthesia not be possible and that was a question by one of the uh, residents uh, that it, I, it is I, not I wish possible nobody faces that kind of extreme situation uh, uh, but see doing uh, doing um, cesarean section in local anesthesia is a very stressful condition for the mother because it doesn't give adequate relaxation and uh, it 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 puts her into a post traumatic stress disorder so it's not a good practice to do under local infiltration yes So, ma'am, what are your views on paramedian approach for spinal? Uh, absolutely, you can do it. There is no there. The technique is um, if you are happy doing it, there is not no contraindication. You can do it. Though technically, it might be a bit difficult. It, if the person, if the operator is is experienced, he can go ahead with it. Right. Some people use it as a first life, first technique of their choice. Those who want to specialize, it's uh, it's perfectly fine. So, ma'am, what is the difference between fentanyl and buprenorphine as an additive in spinal? What is your experience about it? We don't use buprenorphine because it is associated with more nausea and vomiting, and uh, fentanyl is a smoother drug, and they have different class of drugs. So there is the, there is no uh, debate about uh, you know their similarities. They are different, uh, di totally different. Uh, they act at different sites, so they are not the same class of drugs. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, Dr. Mohan Pathak would like to know what is the dose for the repeat spinal. 
see first and foremost i don't like this repeat spinal i have taught it because it is explained in the failed spinal drill and i would like you to wait if you have to do you have to see so many other factors you have to see like is the patient not obese is the airway not difficult is the patient not at risk of bleeding there are so many things despite that if you have done everything people advocate 5 mg because 5 mg is a low dose which is which has got the lowest possibility of traveling up and that is also with the catheter backup okay mom they want to know in case if there is a low dose spinal will adequate level be achieved because the drug volume is low uh, see the drug volume is low definitely that is why these drugs uh, these doses uh, should be accompanied by an epidural catheter in my own right. practice when i use 8 mg with uh, 15 to 20 mics of uh, fentanyl it comes to about uh, 1.8 to 2 ml that is enough to give the height as we all know that uh, intrathecal space is compressed because the engorged venous flexes so the height of the block goes a little high in pregnant patient so 2 ml is a good volume but for teaching purposes and speaking on a platform like i say i will not say do local anesthetic low dose without a catheter backup because the literature says if you are doing 5 to 9 mg do it with a catheter backup Uh, Ma'am, there is a question uh, which is a slightly out of context, but uh, they want to know what is the difference between a physiological murmur or and a pathological murmur. Okay. <laughs> so, so physiological murmur of pregnancy and pathological murmur of pregnancy, there there will be a difference in NYHA status. Most of the women uh, who have got a physiological murmur will not have a grade three or four dyspnea. because of physiological murmur which is mostly because of the hem hemic murmur whereas if it is a murmur of stenosis or regurgitant lesion then due to increase in cardiac output uh, especially during the third trimester it is going to be associated with worsening of the uh, clinical worsening of the mother she'll be she'll be showing signs and symptoms suggestive of nwh3 4 or failure ma'am with your permission can i add something that it could be a soft murmur and a hard murmur or a harsh murmur is <laughs> this is just we have to go through the medicine books again yes. and uh, ma'am with the last question is that someone wants to know uh, wants you to say something about anticoagulants in spinal oh uh, that would be a big topic now because yes uh, ma'am i agree yes so uh, maybe the next talk can be on that because that's a very important topic but it's a big topic what do they want to know like uh, those are like we follow the asra guidelines basically ma'am it is a complete uh, Uh, seminar on itself so we can have it in some other time we'll request our uh, our sir dr navin malhotra sir to have the session again and uh, ma'am there's another question that ma'am can any form of steroids reduce laryngeal edema in difficult airway of antenatal care i haven't come across any report which says you use steroids to reduce See, steroids have their own side effects and there are very minimal uh, indications for use of steroids in pregnancy and that is only for enhancing the fetal lung fetal lung maturity otherwise we are not using steroids we can't just keep on administering uh, any drug to the mother for the sake of preventing that laryngeal edema the reason for laryngeal edema in mother is different it is related to the fluid retention the low os oncotic pressure and there are n number of reasons so th that doesn't mean we we should give steroids that that steroids are not indicated there is no evidence to suggest the role of steroids for that right so ma'am there are so many questions there are so many congratulatory messages for you and since the time is short i'll just take the last question uh, what is the recommended dose of oxytocin after delivery of the baby and do you recommend a direct iv bolus or an infusion uh, actually uh, for a normal elective cesarean section it is a direct uh, bolus only there's a rule of 3 which people follow so 3 units of oxytocin every 3 minutes i mean that's the way it goes and there is uh, infusions also if the patients are normally what we do is we run an infusion uh, after that we give a bolus i think all uh, everywhere all of uh, us practice that so it's the same right now Mom, can we take one more question because the questions are just pouring in for you. Yes, uh, Mom, the next last question is: In a short stature patient, there is a guideline for spinal dose. Is there any guideline for spinal doses for short stature patients? Mm, 
I haven't come across it, but in uh, adverse events, the article which I showed you, they had mentioned that short stitched patients are likely to develop a high block. That's the only thing. Otherwise, uh, all Chinese studies, they have not quoted a very low dose. So they've not quoted it. Uh, the doses are uh, the same uh, between five to nine milligram for a low dose. And uh, if it is, you have to, there is nothing like for five, 10, you give this much for five, eight, you give. But if it is a short stature patient, you have to see what is the um, height of the patient. There, there is a um, evidence to say that if the height is short, there is a high risk of a higher price. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, may I request Dr. Naveen Malhotra, sir? to kindly uh, conclude the session. Uh, Ma'am, maybe uh, sir is on, just uh, okay. communicating. Can we can yeah. just take one more. One uh, or two thank more. you, Madam Tajal, for such an elaborate talk. And uh, it was a wonderful having you us with Thank you very much, Naveen and Dr. Naveen. And I will, am I audible now? Yes, yes sir, sir. Please unmute yourself, but you're audible, sir. So you're audible. You have muted yourself, Dr. Naveen. Uh, hey, ma'am, sir, ki, uh, do, uh, wo hai. So he, uh, sir, sir, uh, uh, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Kajal, for such an elaborate talk on uh, practical aspects of anesthesia for cesarean section and we'd like to have you soon with us again for another class. Thank, uh, you, thank very you very much. See you next Monday for another class. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Everyone. Good night.